Hello and welcome to the third day of our symposium. It's a day of guitars, I think, with the exception of Rami. And well, the first referee to this day, the first lecture, will be by Raphael Ophaus. And the I think he has chosen that microtonality as a structural element in Michael Quell's works for guitar. Uh, Raphael Ofhaus studied classical guitar with Jürgen Ruck at Würzburg and Stefan Schmidt Basel as a scholarship holder of the Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes and completed his studies in 2017 with a masterclass diploma. Parallel to his guitar education, he completed a degree in musicology at the universities of Würzburg and Zürich and graduated in 2021 this year with a Master of Arts. Raphael Ofhaus has been awarded for his achievements in numerous competitions with many national and international scholarships. He is particularly committed to the contemporary music and in this context, regularly collaborates with ensembles, including the Ensemble Moderne and Ensemble Aventure. He has made guest appearance and festivals such as the Ruhr Triennale and the Music Fest Berlin, CD productions for labels, including Naxos and Neos. The collaboration with composers such as Helmut Lachenmann as well as numerous world premieres of works by young composers, which also has decisive, which had decisive influence on his scientific activity. In addition, in addition to contributions to Hans Werner Henze and Michael Quell, the Wilhelm Fink Verlag published his article Lachenmann zum Staunen, Salut für Cordwell, Befreit wahrnehmen, but it's to perceive lightly uh, Lachenmann's Salute for Cardwell. In addition, uh, Raphael Ofhaus is an editor of the EGTA journal. Well, Microtonality as a structural element in Michael Quell's work for guitar. Raphael, it's your turn. Welcome, yeah. Raphael. Thank you. Um, and um, the lecture to August, because I thought it's, it might be easier um, to avoid technical problems. So I recorded it yesterday. I will stay here for question afterwards. But uh, so I hope it's easier with the video. If it's not, I will do it live here. Okay, let's, let, let's try. Thank you. So. Hello, everyone. My lecture. Uh, um, is it okay? Was it okay? It was pretty loud, and uh, so for me it was okay. Yeah, maybe better. Ah, yeah, maybe maybe you can turn turn down a little bit the volume yeah. of your uh, headphones or. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's go. Uh, today deals with the composer Michael Quell and the question of how he uses microtonality in his works to form structures. To exemplify how Quell uses microtonality, I want to focus on two works of him. First, Meister Eckhart und Suravadi, der Klang der Schwinge des Gabriel Hikmat al Ishrak, um, which was finished in 2017 and which is for four microtonal guitars and piano. These microtonal guitars, most of you probably already know because Tolga Hans Scholu has them presented here. If you don't know them, um, these guitars have individually movable frets, so it is possible to set any tuning on the guitar. In addition, we'll have a closer look at the Capriccios from 2004, the only piece from Michael Quell for solo guitar. I would like to show that there are several generalizable and characteristic principles in Quell's composing. I want to listen to a lot of music today with you, so we won't go too much into detail. And if you have any questions, you can probably ask them later. A first principle, which I would like to call Auffächern, which means something like fanning out, 
can be seen in the first part of Meister Eckhart, which I would like to take a closer look at together with you and which we will listen to together afterwards. Meister Eckhart begins with a D circulating under the guitars. This you can see here in the score. Um, this D is repeated in the first two bars in a clear quarter pulse. The resulting sound impression is, as you can probably imagine, um, pretty static. It is changed in bar three rhythmically and tonally by the inclusion of the octave and fifth flageolets. And then in bar five, the expansion of the sound material begins. This D plus sixth tone played by the third guitar breaks through the minimalistic impression of the beginning and as you will hear, um, is in a clear tension to the initial tone. I think uh, one could also speak of a dissonance. Then in bar 10, guitar two jumps into the lower um, octave, which is also a quite eventful moment. The D sharp performed by the second guitar is related to the immediately following tones of the same octave. So it is heard as an entry into polyphony. Here you see the D minus a sixth tone in the third guitar, the C sharp plus a sixth in the first guitar and the D plus a quarter tone in the fourth guitar. And it goes on like this. It's important to say that the use of this D sharp in bar 10 um, does not begin a new independent development process regarding the tone material. It is clearly related to the initial tone and continues the process of expanding from the initial tone. Here you see the tone material from the first bars octave adjusted and adjust the new added tones. I'm sorry for the bad quality. Uh, the ratios show the distance to the initial tone. If you now have a look at the underlined D sharp, um, it is the D sharp from bar 10, uh, and at the development process regarding the distance to the initial tone, you see that it is clearly related. Furthermore, you see that the fanning out does not take place schematically. It is not a quarter tone up, a quarter tone down, half tone up, half tone down, and so on and so on. But nevertheless, it shows in the tendency that first the closer and later the more distant tones occur. One can also see that the tonal space is opened up and down almost evenly. Uh, the expansion continues until bar 16. There we find a tone material including 15 different tones, which contains all available sixth and quarter tones between C and D plus three quarters. As you can see, uh, I have not reduced the fractions, so it becomes clear that every available tone of the sixth and the quarter tone space is reached at this point. Again, you see the ratios showing the distance to the initial tone D, which is pretty much in the middle of this. Regarding the sound impression, <clears throat> it is interesting that while the first newly introduced tones are still heard in relation to the initial tone, the condensing structure is increasingly perceived as a complex microtonal tissue that does not reveal any hierarchization of the tone material. Although the initial tone remains present as the center of the expansion. Anyhow, the initial tone loses its central role during the process in a qualitative sense. Uh, therefore, I want to describe it as an excess tone. Well, who is very much interested into physics would probably speak of a gravitational center. But uh, in the following, I will talk about this excess tone and explain why I think that it's a pretty good term to describe 
what Quell does in his works. This axis ensures the so-called harmonious stability of the whole part. And now I would like to listen to the first part of Meister Eckhart with you. We don't hear this, Raphael, what you are supposed to be speaking now. Yeah, I also I interrupted. interrupted. In chat. Um, do you hear me talking here? Yes. Uh, so let me just have a look here. The, the volume, the volume of my video oh, is... Uh, um, just let me share the screen because I see that it, it works in my presentation. Okay. According to the same principle, now, but could you hear it? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Strange, I couldn't hear it. Uh, Michael Quell. Sorry? I couldn't hear in my computer. In my yeah, computer. I, also, I, I can also hear it in your presentation, but now I think it should be. So I, I presented, so it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, thank you. Also proceeds in El Sueño de la Razón, the fourth movement of the Capuchos. Uh, let's have a closer look in the score. You can see it already here on the screen. And then we can compare the procedure to the one in Meister Eckhart. As well as in Meister Eckhart, you can see that the initial tone here, it is B flat minus an eighth tone, which is also the axis tone, is repeated several times. But unlike Meister Eckhart, here not clear quarter pulse. Here, sorry for the bad quality, you see the tone material from bar 1 to bar 14. This tone material is not octave adjusted. The tones in El Sueño de la Razón are not transposed into different octaves, so it's different to Meister Eckhart. They always remain in the same octave position. Regarding the expansion process, you see that from B flat minus an eighth tone to A plus an eighth tone, it goes to eighth down. Then from B minus flat minus an eighth tone to A, it goes three eighth down. And from the initial tone, again, B flat minus an eighth to B, it goes five eighths up. And you see it is again, 
balanced around the axis tone, it would be easier to see if the V would to be transposed um, one octave higher. Uh, by the way, the Fibonacci series, some of you may have recognized, so 2 8 3 8 5 8 is probably not a coincidence because um, the Fibonacci series is the central organizational instrument of the first section, especially regarding the metric organization, but this is another topic. Um, however, one reason for the different tone material is certainly instrument specific. The tone material is especially if the tones on the first and second string are to continue to ring simply not available in the corresponding pitch on a usual guitar. Uh, the exit tone B flat minus an eighth, for example, cannot be realized on another string without a special technique because the first string is on is the only one which is tuned an eighth note down. So this might be one reason for the differences in the tone material because you just have way more opportunities with four and especially with four microtonal guitars. However, there are several differences that do not depend on the lineup. While the sound material in Meister Eckhart's first part develops exclusively from the D, in El Sueño de la Razón, there are various tones added unprepared, which become the starting point of a new expansion. In other words, there is more than just one axis tone. The E in bar 9, for example, is a fourth of the nearest note a in bar 7 and a tritone away from the initial tone and cannot be interpreted accordingly as part of the gradual expansion process. You can also see this here. So the E here is pretty far away from this A, from this A and this B flat minus an eighth. So this tritone and this is a, uh, is a quarter. The fourth, sorry. It is followed by the E plus a quarter tone in bar 10 and the E minus an eighth in bar 13. You can see them here. These tones are heard in relation to each other and in relation to the E, not to the initial tone B flat minus an eighth. So they belong to the new introduced axis tone E. The same applies uh, to the G sharp plus an eighth in bar 15. The expansion of the sound material is also far more extensive than in Meister Eckert. While in Meister Eckert, the second from C to D plus three quarters is progressed in sixth and uh, quarter tones in El Sueño de la Razón, the material expands in such a way that in bar 19, practically the opening of the total is reached. You can see this here. You see in the upper line, the tone material from bar one to bar 18. And uh, in the line below, you see bar 19. <coughs> As you can see here from bar 1 to bar 18, almost the entire sound space is already opened up and with the culmination point in bar 19, the last unfilled rooms are also occupied. For example, you see that there is a little hole in the upper line around uh, the F, so between E plus a quarter tone and G, and in bar 19 you have the F and the F plus three quarter tones. Now, I would like to listen to the piece. And afterwards, I would like to summarize some generalizable characteristics of the so called principle of fanning out.
this was a video of the Filipinian guitarist Joseph Perez Merandilla. Uh, let's go on. Although the parts compared here can claim unique oh. in their design, various generalizable characteristics for the principle fanning out can be stated. First, the form is opened by the multiple repetition of one tone. This repetition leads to an establishment of the initial tone as a reference point for the subsequent tones. In other words, the initial tone is consolidated as an axis tone. The removal of the newly added tones take place in the tendency from the closer to the more distant um, ones from the axis tones. The extension is almost balanced above and below the axis tone so that the axis tone remains at the center of the development of the tone material. Then the event density increases successively during the expansion and results in the dissolution of the initially clear hierarchy. And last, um, the overall form is characterized by an increasing energetics striving towards a culmination point upon reaching which the developed material is present in a confined space. These general characteristics can also be identified in other works, so not just in Meister Eckhart and in uh, Svenja de la Razón, there are several other works like The Beginning of a Blaring Cloud, Geschöpfe der Fahrt, or also in Dark Matter. So it's a principle which you can call a principle because it happens more than just once in the work of Michael Krell. After this very detailed look at the principle of fanning out, I would now like to briefly introduce some other principles that make clear the importance of the axis tone and the thinking starting from an octave adjusted material. The second principle I want to show seems to be diametrically different from the first one. It is the principle of narrowing the tone material in the direction of the axis tone, which can be observed in the final part of Meister Eckhart. The part begins in bar 165 with a sequence of bottleneck actions, which in a few bars in a descending movement and in a natural rondo, extremely condense and lead into the final part. The final part begins at the moment of highest excitation. The piano plays very fast figures in a very high and very low octave. In between, the assistant produces several long notes with bow hairs. The guitar play um, different kinds of tremoli. And many of them are played with a bow. It seems that the tone material is arranged around the E in his various octaves. If you just have a look uh, in the guitar, you have uh, F plus a sixth tone, an E plus a third, an F sharp, and an E minus a third, which is all more or less around E. This also applies to the figures from the piano as well at the tones that are played with the bow hair by the assistant. The figures are arranged around the E. However, it is remarkable that the E as an axis tone does not appear particularly frequently in the texture. In the guitars, the tone appears only in bar 174 and in the piano figures, it also appears rather casually. The assistant plays them more often, but always together with other tones in the same position as I have marked it here. So the E is not marked as a central tone of the part and is also not marked in any other way. Even at the end, the ear is not informed retrospectively about the central axis of the section. Meister Eckert does not end on the axis tone E, but sinks down to the D flat. 
Nevertheless, when looking at the entire sound material, the central position of the E becomes obvious. You see it here. Uh, you see the octave adjusted tone material in the guitars from bar 170 until the end. If you now imagine a line at the level of the E, it would be almost uh, exactly in the middle. If we have a closer look, it also becomes evident that in addition to the axis tone E, a second axis tone is integrated, the axis around B. Here you see it at, uh, as the seventh tone of the tone material. And here you see it uh, in the score in bar 173. Comparing the principles of fanning out and narrowing, there are various disti distinctive features. Just as with fanning out, Quell develops the sound material in relation to one or more axis tones. The material is also arranged, balanced around the axis tone. And by reversing the event, the energy development is also reversed from an increasing event density in the fanning out to a decreasing event density in the narrowing. However, it is remarkable that various characteristic impressions for fanning out do not reverse. The axis tone is not established as such, and it rather remains hidden. Even the characteristic eventful moments do not turn around, they simply disappear. Unfortunately, there is not enough time now to also listen to this wonderful part of the piece because I would like to introduce another principle. While the first two principles are pretty similar in structure, the fo following one is kind of different because there are several simultaneously present axis tones here. Central for bars 97 to uh, 130 of Meister Eckert is the spectrum of contra E flat. The piano tremulates um, this tone at the beginning of the part in the forte and then lets the sound ring for two and a half bars using the pedal. In the echo of the attack, the spectrum becomes clearly audible, an effect that is much more striking in the live concert than on the CD, but anyhow. Afterwards, the piano tremulates the contra E flat again. But now the third and fourth guitar also play flageolets with the bow into the piano sound. These are marked here. The flageolets correspond to those tones of the overtone spectrum, which are already clearly audible in the echo of the piano sound. The D flat minus a sixth in the fourth guitar corresponds to the 14th overtone. The E in the third guitar corresponds to the 17th overtone and from the F again performed by the fourth guitar corresponds to the 18th overtone. Um, after the piano has repeated the contra E flat again, the guitars begin to play around the overtones. Until now, they just repeated the tones of the spectrum. Now they start deviating them. Uh, and expanding it, but in a clear relation to the overtone spectrum. Looking on the score, you see that the tone material is related to the position of the partial. Here you see the first guitar in bar 104. I'm sorry for the bad quality. And underneath you see the tone material. Um, and underneath this, you see the overtones of contra E flat, the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, but just reversed as you see. You clearly see that the tone material moves between the 12th and the 15th partial. Uh, these tones, um, so the tone material is more or less close to the overtones. The, D flat minus the six deviates 14 cents from the 14th overtone. The D minus the six deviates five 
from the 15th, the B plus is the XKBS 24, which is already quite a lot from the 13th of a term. The texture is expanded by various ex actions in the piano, as well as various tremoli in the guitars. They are also related to the spectrum. Like the G minus 14 fans in bar 107, which is a pure fifth from contra E flat. This you can see here. The reference to the spectrum of contra E flat remains constitutive for the entire movement. In this part, each overtone of contra E flat can ultimately be understood as an axis tone. So every partial and the fundamental can be understood as an axis tone. Um, and the figures move around these axis tones. Usually, a clear relationship between the tone material of a figure and an axis tone can be seen. Even if, due to the density of the axis tones in the high position, the axis tone is not always clearly understandable, it is clearly used as an organizational instrument. However, it seems to me that there are no comparably conceived parts in Quell's work, so it's pretty problematic to speak of a generalizable principle with equally generalizable characteristics. But anyhow, I think it's pretty interesting to see how this idea of an axis tone um, is also fitting on such complex structures. Even if other parts in other works are based on a spectrum, for example, in a dark matter, you have parts like this, it seems to me that viewing each individual overtone as an axis tone, uh, as it happens here, is a singular approach of the composer. So I wouldn't say that there are generalizable characteristics because therefore uh, we would need something to compare it with. Before we uh, listen to some more music, I would like to say that in addition to the compositional principles presented here, a large number of other principles can be identified in Michael Krell's work, which uh, can be analyzed more or less with the categories introduced here. It should be pointed out that the compositional principles are by no means to be misunderstood as programmed schemes that are superimposed on the works like templates. They are rather topoi that are taken up and processed by the composer subjectively and intuitively in each work anew and in the context of the respective work. Finally, I would like to thank you for listening. I would like to thank Augustine for organizing everything. And I would like to thank Michael Eckrell for the inspiring debates uh, we have so often the last month and years. Um, and enjoy the Spectral Symphony from Meister Eckert. <laughs>
Bravo. Bravo. Thank you very much. It, I think it was a brilliant analysis and you make well with the content of it. <laughs> and I would like to hear much more of this music, especially the symphony, uh, Spectral Symphony, that the TS takes me uh, as well. Mm. Uh, I want to ask about other questions uh, to your lecture. Any questions in the group? Otherwise, I would like to invite uh, Michael Quell uh, uh, to, to join us. Maybe, hello, what an honor and a pleasure to see you, Michael. Hello. Great to see you. Hello, it's a pleasure for me to listen to this wonderful lecture and <laughs> see you again. Thank you. Yes, yes. yes. great one. So for the group, are there any questions? I think my colleague Johannes uh, took some notes. Uh, yes, but <laughs> that it's not so important now. I think uh, we have a composer with us. Perhaps somebody will ask him some question. Okay, yeah, I knew, yeah, I knew the music. I, uh, it was also a pleasure to see Joseph Mirandilla. And uh, yeah, uh, you, you're all doing a, a great work, great presentation here. And uh, I don't know if uh, there are no questions. I'm checking also the chat. Okay. If there are no uh, questions, would you like to add anything, Michael, about uh, uh, either about the pieces you presented or maybe new projects uh, involving microtones, involving guitars, involving... Oops. Yes, and uh, the last piece I've composed, it's uh, not, a piece, not a piece for guitars, it's a piece of a uh, chamber ensemble. Uh, I used a lot of um, microtonal um, issues and in a, in a bit in a other way than the, the spectral symphony you listened at the last piece, a bit developing a bit much more to um, several multiphonic multi structures on woodwinds, which are not static. Often multiphonics and woodwinds are used static, and that's not, not so interesting for me because I like to think in dynamic systems and systems which are uh, developing more and more, and, and I use them, uh, which um, different microphonal, uh, micro multiphonic twirls which are tooling into another, and specific techniques on, on the bassoon, for example, with uh, large tremolos from the very low to the very high register, which is not not um, not used to to have a tremolo between two tones, but which is used to have a, a initiation of the whole spectrum of the instrument, and so. I composed uh, something like a spectral symphony for, for a chamber ensemble, uh, five instruments and, and, for example, 30, 36 or 40 voices. Wow. And, and, and that's, that's quite interesting. And the next, next work I'm um, working on is a um, um, string, uh, string quartet. So, but, but then, after then, I like to compose <laughs> a kind of duo for Raphael and, and Stefan Korn. <laughs> it's, uh -huh. that's a project. I, I like to do much earlier, but there are so so many other things, and then <laughs> I, I think in half a year I'll start that piece. I'm very very much looking forward to. No, everyone, no excuses anymore. And uh, I like, you know, I'm very inter personally very interesting, uh, very interested in understanding how composers perceive music specific topics. And uh, I wrote down here a quotation by you, me, uh, I guess it's by, by you, Michael, uh, Raphael can correct me, about describing a complex microtonal tissue. And in a way, you know, I'm trying to transcend this idea to my own ideas. I really like this idea of seeing, feeling, feeling this uh, tissue of uh, complex uh, uh, microtonal uh, tissue. I think it's... Uh, is uh, very uh, hitting uh, this description, uh, or is it from you, Raphael? The quotation, maybe. Quoted, but I, I can imagine that Michael mentioned this word sometimes. Uh, 
So uh, I'm not sure. I, I I didn't quote it directly, but I can imagine that you, uh, he would use the same words for describing what he does. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it ha ha had a great impact on me today, actually, just to try to understand exactly how what you're perceiving, describing it with these words. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any questions? In I'm checking also the chat. Any questions from anyone? You can raise your hand. You can write in the chat. You can open your microphone. Uh, perhaps a question to the uh, the spectrals. Uh, as I made the experience, uh, it's very complicated to make them sound together like the 15th and 16th and 17th together but after uh, as following pitches in a, in a melody form uh, they are really good music but together there is a, there exists a shrilling tone in it, and they sound like a sieve uh, a saw tape uh, wave isn't it but together all the uh, overtones make a special waveform that's the saw tooth, a saw teeth, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is a not well sound to the ears, but in a melodic way, it's very good. And you can use other overtones up to the 48th, perhaps, and, and you will compose Michael, your chamber symphony. Uh, it's a, 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 Excuse me, is it right? The Chamber Symphony or a Great Symphony? The 40s, 40 is no, 40 voices. It's, uh, it's, it's for, for only five instruments. Ah, and 40 but, voices. But it's about 40 voice tones because of the multiphonics. Uh -huh. The multiphonic structure is a very, very complex structure, yes. like, like a music for, as I did it in Dark Matter, for only for mm -hmm. three woodwinds for, mm -hmm. for trio uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. and and it's um, in the middle part it seems to be a, a piece for symphony orchestra ah uh -huh. it seems all to the be. instruments uh -huh. but yeah. we don't play multiphonics uh -huh. don't they play yeah. uh, multiphonics or are they included yes yes they they, they play they are included but, of course mm -hmm. but uh, multiphonics in which are twirled into another yeah. uh -huh. So they, I understand. Mm -hmm. Multiphonic fingerings, yes, and and trommelating mm -hmm. them all into another. So you have so a to, very yeah. complex. So structure. together, it's a complex of forty voices and more. Yes, uh, yes, that's that's right. Uh, now I understand. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a comment in the chat, but uh, I think yeah, we have uh, one last minute. Uh, Matt, you want to say something? Can you say the comment uh, on the microphone, maybe? Okay. Uh, I am I'm outside, but hopefully you can hear me. Yes. I just I just wondered if the composer could say something about the the access tone as a structural device in this music. If, if there's time for that. Uh, y yes. Let's go. Okay. Yeah, the access tone. The access tones as Raphael. Uh, explained are uh, used in a very very different way and the one way they are an axis from which on the the tone material is is um, increasing which is growing and developing on the other uh, way they are uh, different axis tones which are in in a in a polyphony and a polyphon structure from each point is the tone material is is developing sometimes it's it's going down on the axis is focusing on it like a like a vortex for example and this is not only um, an idea which is only on the on the um, um, only used on the level of pitch it's I use all these principles a very complex uh, in a very complex interwoven into other uh, aspects which are not only related to to pitch which are for example as, as Raphael um, spoke a bit on uh, especially about the El Sueño del Razón which is maybe related in metrum in rhythm, rhythm which is uh, related in form and density and all that aspects so in for example in in uh, El Sueño del Razón there's a um, playing with with the um, imagination of Fibonacci theory, for example, it's 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 um, something like a generated um, 
hermeneutic aspect of the composition, because it, the hermeneutic aspect is is um, uh, produced by structure. It's not not um, put on the piece. It's it's a, re um, a result of the structure. The structure seems to be uh, the rhythmical structure seems to be organized by Fibonacci. And I, I did it very consciously because at, I, the, the El Sueño de la Razón, the dream of, of, of reason, uh, for me is a very ambivalent aspect. And I like to give an idea about the, about the music composed in, in the Freiburg, Freiburg School of the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Many, many pieces are related to Fibonacci and, and numeric um, organization, but it isn't. It isn't uh, organized in Fibonacci. It seems to be at the very first, from the very first beginning on, there's minimum deviation of this, and then the deviation is getting more and more and more, and the and it's producing the own space of the composition. And at the same, uh, in the same principle, it's it's uh, related to the microtonal structure. You have several axis tones which are related to to another and given a complex network of axes and from from um, excuse me uh, michael i'm really sorry to be so uh, sure. mean and uh, interrupt you can we leave this uh, topic for okay. the for the break uh, the computer the link is open so you can continue discussing mm -hmm. sam is already Good waiting idea. there for for the next uh, presentation uh, thank you very much congratulations for mm -hmm. the wonderful presentation very great. So, the next guitar. Sam K from Great Britain, and a theme he has chosen resonance, overtones, and miniature voices aspects of his recent compositions. Uh, to introduce Sam K, he's an English guitarist and composer, and is one of the guitar's leading exponents of new music. Sam's performances have taken him to some of the most exciting venues and festivals of the United Kingdom and abroad with appearances in St. John Smith Square, City Showcase Festival, Huddersfield uh, Contemporary Music Festival, Non-Classical Institute of Contemporary Arts, NSO St. Luke's, Avgarde in Norway, the Personal Room, the South Bank Centre and Taijin May, May Festival. Sam has been a Park Lane Group young artist and has recorded for both Nava Timber and Metier record labels. His playing has been broadcast on both uh, Lai Junction and the uh, New Music Show on BBC Radio 3. Sam studied at the Royal College of Music in London with Gary Ryan and Chris Stowe. He has also studied with Vincent Lindsay Clark, Michael Seth Gordon, Michael Finnessy, Gilbert B. Barberian, and Greg Audion, and graduated from the University of Southampton with first class honors on the Edward Wood Memorizer Prize in Music. In 2020, Sam completed a PhD in composition at the Brunel University, London, under the supervision of Christopher Fox and John Croft. As a composer, Sam's work has been performed uh, by the most exciting young ensembles and soloists, and his music is published by Babel's course. Now he is also an educator, uh, currently a tutor in guitar at Brunel University in London, and he has been a guest lecturer in composition for guitar at Coventry University and a lecturer in composition and orchestration at Kingston University. Wow, it's your turn now, Sam Cave, and I look forward to your presentation. Hi. Thank <laughs> um, you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And hello, Agustin. Nice to see you. Again. Uh, hi, Sam. Uh, great um, to see you. Thank you. And uh, well, I'm very happy to be here and speaking today. It's my first time uh, presenting at this wonderful conference, and uh, I would like to begin by uh, saying congratulations to uh, Agustin and Janice for the organization, uh, and also to uh, everybody that has made such fantastic work. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, hearing about all of the wonderful music that uh, everyone's been talking about. So if I just 
share. Hopefully you can see this, my presentation. Does that come clear, Agustin? Perfect, well, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk uh, about, uh, well, these things, resonance, uh, overtones and, and miniature voices. This is uh, some aspects of some of my recent compositions. And uh, in particular, I'm only really going to talk about uh, microtonal aspects um, of my music. Uh, so if I skip over anything that, that, that uh, looks interesting or not very interesting, uh, that, that'll be the reason why. And uh, we can chat about it later. But these are the main things that I'm going to uh, say something about in, my, in three of my pieces. Um, and uh, hopefully this will give uh, an insight into some of the microtonal practices and aspects that I've been exploring, uh, and uh, also um, some clues as to where um, or what I might explore next. The first piece that I would like to discuss is uh, At the Edge of His Dreams, uh, which was commissioned by the Thornham Summer Festival in 2017. And this uh, was a very interesting commission because um, this festival is a small chamber festival in beautiful countryside in the UK, in Suffolk. And uh, it's a, a festival that comprises really of solos and duos and trio recitals across a, a long weekend. Uh, and uh, for the 2017 edition, the organiser invited me to play some concert, but also uh, wanted to, in the final concert of the festival to have a piece that was bringing together all of the instruments that had performed uh, in, in the festival. Um, and uh, so they sent me the list, the ensemble list, and it was a very interesting one. Uh, but at the same time, I noticed that it was due to be performed in a church. And one of my great passions uh, in life is, is church bells and bell ringing in the English change ringing style. And so I immediately wanted to include the bells of this church in my piece. And so uh, I asked for uh, the organisers to send me a recording of these of these bells. Um, I should say that um, this piece, the use of bells in this piece, is a little bit different to some of the other uses that I've done before. In this piece, they're used as an instrumental resource, all six bells uh, that the church has, which make a ring of six in G. Uh, are used as, as an instrumental resource uh, and not necessarily as I have done before as a, an inspiration uh, through tuning analysis of their overtones or uh, looking at the characteristic um, partials of individual bells, uh, but rather using a, a whole ring of six as uh, an instrumental resource. And so because of that, um, I did not perform any complex analysis on any individual bells, but rather I took an overview of all six that um, they are essentially sitting almost exactly a quarter tone sharp of um, equal temperament. And uh, it's really this difference between the tuning of the bells uh, when considered all together as a, as a ring of six, a scale of six, and the equal temperament as defined by the piano that uh, defines the, the structure of this, of this music. And so I suppose what I'm really talking about here is using um, this microtonal shift between the, the, the bells and the piano as a structural principle uh, in, in this piece. And um, this was uh, a very interesting uh, idea um, because, or it was an interesting idea to me, um, because I had not had access before to a venue that had a real life ring of uh, church bells and ringers who were willing to ring them during uh, a composition of mine. So I wanted to show you uh, the, the first page of the, of the score and show a little bit about how this structural principle uh, is, is working. Uh, the, the first thing that uh, happens is that the bells uh, function as a, as a trigger uh, for a passage of music, and um, they do that by being chimed uh, in what ringers call rounds, which is down the scale. Um, in, in bell ringing, the numbering is the opposite way around to in music, um, and the, the tonic always has the highest number, and 
uh, number one is always the highest pitch. Uh, so when the bells chime in rounds one, two, three, four, five, six, that actually goes down the scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, like, like that, uh, which is a little bit strange. But anyway, so the bells trigger uh, this passage of music by chiming very quickly down their scale. And then the cello has to, in this case, it's the cello, has to pick out uh, its pitch. Uh, in this case, it, it starts on a B and match the pitch of that bell. Uh, I'm very interested in um, adjustments of tuning and, um, uh, and, and timbre in real time to uh, a, a stimulus. And in this case, it's a live stimulus as well from the bells. The, pell the cello has to match uh, its pitch. And then glissandos down to equal temperament. Uh, whereby it is passed to the accordion uh, and then back to the cello uh, before the piano, uh, eventually is passed on to the piano, before the piano uh, gives its uh, response to the bells, uh, its, its ghost, if you like, in equal temperament, before uh, the uh, pitch is passed back again through the uh, accordion and the cello and back to the bells uh, for the next trigger. Um, by means again of a, of a cello glissando, this time upwards instead of downwards. And this is essentially the structuring principle of this piece, um, that the, uh, the bells are the trigger and then the instrumental um, resources, usually the, the bowed strings, uh, but also the clarinet uh, through uh, glissandi and, and, and pitch bending and later um, harmonics, natural overtones. Uh, manipulate the, the tuning world of the bells into equal temperament uh, in time for a, for a ghost in the piano. And the uh, intervening uh, episodes in between each bell trigger grow and contract uh, to form the, the, the dramatic arc of the piece. Uh, in the middle of the piece, there is a secondary uh, ghost, which uh, is the guitar, which is off stage. Um, and uh, that brings another dimension. So in that passage, the bells are the trigger, and then we have an episode, and then we have uh, an e a ghost or an echo in the piano, and then a ghost ghost in, in the guitar, uh, which is off stage and uh, provides a very ethereal sound. So I'd like to play you uh, the first uh, section or couple of sections of uh, At the Edge of His Dreams.
And so there we just heard this, the, the next um, bell trigger. So that was um, a short episode at the beginning and then quite a long one uh, afterwards um, before the next trigger uh, of the bells, uh, bringing back that um, quarter sharp area for someone to take up and uh, manipulate. So I suppose really what this piece hinges on is a rubbing against each other of uh, a microtonally inflected uh, world and an equally tempered uh, 12 EDO uh, world. And uh, that's something that I'm very interested in and something that uh, grew um, or was, was brought into even more the foreground uh, in on a solo instrument in this piece, uh, Pocanten, for Russian seven string guitar. Um, this piece uh, came about um, because the great uh, Morten Falk, who is, I, I consider him to be the world's leading uh, authority and, and virtuoso on the Russian seven string guitar, um, asked, came to the UK to give a concert. He gave a lunchtime concert at Brunel University where I was teaching and um, he, invited me to uh, write a piece for him. And it's a fascinating instrument, the, the, the Russian guitar, because it has a completely different tuning scheme uh, to the, what we think of as the, the modern guitar, the standard uh, guitar being tuned in fourths with one third. Um, and uh, even different to what we know to be, you know, seven string guitars based on that tuning where you would have a low B and then the normal uh, E, A, D, G, B, E. Uh, this Russian guitar, uh, which had a very brief flowering, I suppose, in the uh, late 1800s, um, had a, um, a tuning that is the second inversion triad of G major, which is a very strange uh, tuning to me, a very strange decision to, to make, uh, because um, if you want to play a major chord in seven pitches, that's very easy, you know, you just dump a finger across all seven strings and strum away. But if you want to play a minor chord uh, in seven pitches, it's very, very difficult. In fact, almost impossible because the, the, the minor third is behind you all the time. It would have been much more sensible, I think, with the benefit of historical hindsight to um, tune it to a minor chord. And then if you want a major one, you just add the major third, like some of the early blues players uh, did uh, in the United States. Um, but anyway, that's uh, an aside, I suppose. Uh, I was struck by this tuning, having this beautiful um, balance, uh, but also slight uh, instability in this second inversion idea with this low D and then two triads on the top. And so I, I wanted to do something with that. And I decided that it would be really interesting to try to have two tuning worlds uh, manifesting at the same time uh, on the instrument. And so I designed this tuning where the bottom three strings, strings seven, six, and five, are equally tempered, just as they are in the standard tuning of the instrument. And then the top uh, four strings would be uh, tuned to these cent deviations, uh, 51 cents sharp, 31 cents flat, 4 cents sharp, and 29 cents flat. And uh, to try to create an interesting dichotomy and, and division and coloristic potential across the different registers of the instrument. And uh, these pitches, um, the hertz of which are underneath for tuning uh, purposes with a tone generator, correspond to partials of the overtone series of, of A, uh, being they are the 11th, 7th, obviously, 9th and uh, 21st. Um, overtones of, of an A. And uh, that was my setup to try to get a guitar that was um, simultaneously in G uh, and uh, in G, but through a spectral filter of, of A. Uh, and that's reflected in the materials that we're going to see in a minute. Uh, there are two materials in this piece uh, trying to reflect the title. Pokanten means on the edge in Swedish. And this is what I've tried to create, a, a feeling of capriciousness, but, all, uh, but intimacy, uh, which is definitely, uh, to me anyway, uh, a gestural identity that the guitar does extremely well. Um, so I propose to show you these two materials uh, and then explain a little bit about how they, uh, about how they work. So here are the two uh, materials for uh, Bokanten. Uh, the first one is the dramatic, uh, wild and capricious uh, material. And the second one is uh, the much more hushed and undulating. Uh, and it's first in its first appearance here in this higher register. 
uh, quite sinuous um, style of material. And one thing that uh, is I'm really interested in, uh, like I said before, is this rubbing together of different um, worlds uh, to create a harmonic identity. And um, in this piece, it manifests uh, quite clearly as multiple colorations in, of the same pitch. Um, this is perhaps, an obsession with this is perhaps born of my uh, dual life as a performer on the guitar, where uh, the multiple colorations of a single pitch, even if it's the same tuning, uh, all equally tempered, are very, very many and very varied. You can play the same pitch on a thicker or a thinner string to get a different string length. You can vary the plucking position. So the multiple colorations of one pitch on a standardly tuned guitar are uh, multi, uh, varied and uh, extraordinarily beautiful. And that's definitely something that I try to bring to my composition for all instruments, whether that's for orchestra or uh, a solo instrument or even for the guitar. Uh, so if we take a look here in the green circles are the appearances of different colorations of uh, of D um, on various different strings in this first material. And uh, if we show the colors of that D, uh, what we're uh, dealing with is uh, a, fluctuating, um, a fluctuating field of different kinds of D. Uh, when it appears, this is the order that they appear in, the third string first, uh, and it's flat like a seventh partial, and then it appears on the sixth string, and it's the th third partial of an equally tempered string, so it's sort of nominally two cents sharp, and, uh, and then on the first string it's flat again, uh, and then on the fourth string it's really sharp, and then on the seventh string, which only appears once very near the end as a grace note here, uh, it's equally tempered, as long as you get the tuning right. And so there's this fluctuation around this D that you might find in e equal temperament and an interval of one size above and then a slightly smaller one and a bigger one below and maybe a little bit related to these um, axis tones that we just heard about but um, here the axis tone is not uh, is not clearly stated um, uh, overtly at all uh, at least not in this first iteration and in the second material the same thing is is happening but it's to begin with only uh, E and D this E and D tone of various sizes is really important, is uh, the, the crux of this um, second material. And uh, as it progresses through the piece, it moves down in register. So the colorations of the pitches change. Um, Morton uh, was due to premiere this piece uh, three times now we've had to delay. The festival, the International Russian Guitar Festival was delayed twice. And then there was a guitar competition in Poland that he was going to play at which got cancelled and moved online. There were no concerts. Um, and so uh, we haven't had a premiere of this piece yet. Uh, and uh, on top of that, Morton has not been well recently. So yesterday uh, I mocked up my guitar to be like a Russian seven string guitar. Fortunately, there's one string you don't need. And I put together a little recording so that we can hear these first two materials. So I'd like to play that for you now. So hopefully that comes across uh, clearly uh, in that uh, recording, these multivaried colorations of, of, of the same pitches uh, on different strings, uh, but also uh, with different microtonal inflections um, to create the, the sonic identity, to create the world uh, that this piece lives in. 
Uh, I often like to liken this to um, considering shades and hues of colors in the visual arts. Um, and uh, the um, analogy that I, I try to think of in my head is the difference between when a, when a, when a kid draws something or when I draw something who are not talented at uh, visual arts at all, uh, it might come out something like this. Here's a tree uh, that someone has drawn and it's definitely a tree, right? It's quite a good drawing of a tree, but the coloration is what interests me because the, the trunk, for example, is one kind of brown, yeah? And the leaves are one kind of green. And uh, I, this is a very interesting idea to me because I, I prefer a drawing such as this beautiful watercolor on the right hand side, where if we did the same sort of thing and examined the, uh, the trunk of the tree, we would find uh, probably uh, 10 or 20 different shades of, of brown and each one is contributing to the overall uh, effect uh, that the viewer can see. Uh, that it gives perspective and uh, an impression of light, the way the light plays on the tree and the way that um, the angle and the perspective is, is heightened by this, these colorations. And that's something that I uh, try to emulate in my, in my music. And this is an analogy that I try to hold in my head as I'm going along. Uh, the final piece that I would like to discuss uh, is Dreams of Flight. Um, which is uh, brand new. It had its premiere this year, uh, earlier this year. Um, so it's leapfrogged Pocantin uh, because there was a hall available to make a recording here in the UK at the Menuhin School to have a lovely concert hall. And uh, in, in this piece, I try to paint the double bass as, a, as, a, as an Icarus uh, type character, I suppose, uh, that um, the uh, it tries to rise up from this really low E and there are lots of rising gestures and trying to achieve a, a free soaring sort of flight. Um, he never quite manages it except in a dream, uh, except in some dreamscape moments. Um, but in this piece, what I wanted to talk about today is the way that the microtonal um, inflections of pitches construct a voice leading that contributes to this, the, the gestural shape. So here uh, is, um, a, uh, a general trend of this low E rising up to a D and then the next time in red and then the next time up to an E in blue uh, and then we get as high as a G and then we get as high as a G sharp and then we fall back down to an F sharp at the end so there's a trajectory that goes up up a bit more bit more up a bit more and then finally just tailing off a little bit at the end such as like perhaps the first little moment of a flight of a, of a bird taking off. And that's a, you know, a normal sort of gestural idea uh, and gestural identity for a piece like this. But what I've tried to do, if we consider the scent deviations of these pitches, then hopefully we'll see something interesting that um, the microtonal inflection supports this gestural identity through voice leading. So this D is 31 cents flat because it's the seventh uh, partial of the low E string. And then immediately we get another D, but now the, um, so the first overtone, the second partial of the low of the D string. So it's nominally no cent uh, deviation. Yeah, it's, it's the octave above the open string. And uh, so that is a higher, microtonally speaking, than the D that is uh, 31 cents flat. So the, so the microtonal inflection here supports the direction of the voice leading, which is up. In these opening gestures, this effect is diluted slightly because um, this second D is, um, is down uh, a, um, an octave from the, the higher D. Uh, but later on, they come together and they, they we'll see, they form uh, an even clearer gesture of this. The, the, the E in blue that rises up uh, the second upwards trajectory is equally tempered, that's the eighth partial, and then this E uh, plays the same trick. Uh, it's the third partial of the A string, so it's two cents sharp, and it's a tiny difference, but I really believe it is a difference, and you can definitely hear a change in colour, and it's the same dilution trick, it's um, an octave below. And then uh, here, this G is the seventh partial of A, so it's 31 cents flat, and then we hit the high point, which is the tenth partial of the E string, uh, being a G sharp, 14 cents flat. And on its second iteration, we hit 
the high point, and then we're tailing off to uh, F sharp, being the ninth partial and being four cents uh, sharp. And immediately after we get an F sharp as the uh, fifth partial of the D string being 14 cents flat. So there the microtonal inflection is going from something that's slightly sharp to something that's a bit flat. So it's supporting this tailing off uh, gestural identity. So I would like to show uh, Will Dwerden, extraordinary young player at the Royal College of Music playing uh, the first uh, minute or so of Dreams of Flight. So if anybody um, wants to see some more scores or anything, there are some links here. Uh, but the most interesting one of these links um, is probably the bottom one, because this uh, is a database and is how I found out about the bells at Thorn and Magna. Uh, this is a database of all of the bells um, in the, uh, well, I think in the world that are hung for English style change ringing, Dove's Guide. Uh, it's a light blue book if you buy the book. Um, and it's a very interesting resource for people who are interested in bells. Um, and uh, if anybody's interested in that sort of thing, I can point you to some very interesting sites with tuning analyses of individual church bells and uh, things like that. Uh, thank you very, very much indeed for your attention and uh, looking forward to any questions or comments that, uh, that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. And that's our question to our audience, our questions. Uh, congratulations on your presentation, oh, uh, thank you. Sam. <laughs> thank you, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank really you. Beautiful themes there. Oh. I have a question and a comment. A great presentation, Sham. Oh, uh, very intriguing. Uh, and uh, I was re really fascinated um, by the bell topic, uh, you know, since I'm a Carillon student and uh -huh, very uh, enthusiast. Yeah. And uh, indeed, bells uh, are very intriguing because, you know, the natural harmonic series of a bell is so much different from yes. the any others. And uh, you have microtron intervals. Uh, in them and also mm, the you can hear uh, some of them when you are standing next to the bell yes. especially the sharper minor minor third yes uh, indeed it's, it's yeah. really well, loud helix and johnson style of tuning the with the minor third being slight, slightly mm -hmm. red yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. They that idea, yeah, as a foundry, yeah. You know, it, it, it is a very, um, also, you know, um, there's a very uh, interesting person in the Carillon world uh, called Jakob van Eyck. Uh, oh, he, yes. I, I, yeah, I, I, yes. With yes. Heimony Brothers, he was the first uh, person to actually listen to those overtones, to those mm. partials, and uh, try to understand why 
why those partials make the bells sound good. Yes. You know what I mean, yeah. I do know Very what you mean. So for, yeah. any, for anybody that, uh, that hasn't looked into how, how bells produce their, their sound, it's worth saying that, that bells don't produce individual pitches. They, they produce complex uh, multiphonics, essentially, or, yeah. or yeah. their own partials. And what's amazing is that those overtones do not correspond to the natural series of overtones that you find on a, exactly. or a column of air. They, they, they produce, uh, uh, at a very low partial of their harmonic series, the pitch of a minor third. Uh, which, which, which in the harmonic series of overtones is very far, you know, is four octaves and a minor third above the fundamental. But, but bells produce it uh, an octave and a minor third above the fundamental. Uh, and so they're, they're really fascinating things. Sorry, that was just worth saying in case people yeah, yeah. looked into uh, bells. Of course, there's a very interesting uh, publication by John Govnes from G uh, GCNA um, mm. where he talked about those uh, overtones in modern carolans. Yes. But uh, did you hear about the uh, instrument in uh, Belgium in uh, Newport? Uh, be, uh, this is a very interesting carillon because this is, I think, the only carillon with split sharps. Yes. Uh, so it's a microtonal carillon. Yes, it's amazing. Yes, I have. Yeah. And I would like to write a piece for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to put in the chat a link to a website, which is very good. This is um, Bill Hibbert's uh, PhD and other things, which discusses a lot about the tuning of bells. Uh, so if anybody is interested, that's an extremely good website to, to look at. Uh, and, uh, is your piece available somewhere uh, for yes. those bells? Because I would love to uh, uh, hear it. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, it's available on the publisher's website. There's a full oh, recording great. there on bells. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, any questions in the group? Otherwise, I might uh, ask uh, you something. Maybe, to maybe me, like a very, very fast compositional yes. question, because you have like, um, uh, first of all, congratulations oh. for the pieces and for the presentation. Uh, I'm interested in kind of how uh, you integrate an instrument like that in a composition, because yes, they are magnificent. Yes, they have a very unique spectrum, but then you have this, and then you have other instruments, and the philosophy most of the times does not fit. So you go from the bell aspect that I want these tones, I have to fix all the ensemble around it, or you compose your thing and either the bells fit or not. Ah, so, yeah. Uh, so in the case of this piece that I talked about at, at, at the edge of his dreams, the... the spotting in my dove's guide that the, the church had bells and then getting the organizers to send me they made a recording uh on a, a a sunday when they were ringing for the church service and that was the starting point was understanding that that uh it was a moment when uh, i heard those bells and i knew that i didn't want to do any complex analysis on individual bells which is something that i've done before in lots of other pieces there are chords that are derived from the overtones of an individual bell say that, that someone has done very complex analysis of in this piece i wanted to use all of them because you know i was being greedy and wanted to use them as a as an instrumental resource so i heard that recording and didn't want to get bogged down in, in any sort of dogmatic analysis of individual bells. I want I just took the overview that these make a scale of G that are, that's, that's basically a quarter tone sharp, and I knew that the ensemble had a piano, and that was that was the moment that th those two things rubbing against each other and making a color, making a harmonic field by being in attraction or repulsion against each other. That was the starting point. So in this case, uh, the the bells came very first. And without them, I would have written a different piece because they they provided harmonic color, but also a way to design a structural principle. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Th thank you very much. Um, uh, actually, my question is very similar to Eleni's uh, because I, I wanted to ask you about this piece at the edge of, of a dream. Mm. I mean, if you had to perform this in another church, yes, with other bells. Yes. How would you adapt this composition or even if you if there would be maybe other considerations mm -hmm. that maybe previously you had in mind and then because of these specific bells uh, in for this composition, maybe you left away. How, how would you or if you would decide to to have another performance in another place with other bells? Yes. Uh 
uh, it's a very good question. It's one I thought about a lot. That piece, if you want to have the bells live, then that piece is really um, a, uh, a site-specific piece. Mm -hmm. well, if you had uh, a church that had a ring of six in G, or any ring in, in G, that you could take the lowest six and they would make the same scale, but they wouldn't have the same microtonal inflection. So then you could play that piece live like that, but the pitch that the cello plays at the beginning would not be the same one. It might be closer to equal temperament or further away, depending on the church that you were in. Uh, so the instruction that the cellist has to match the pitch of the bell, uh, you know, is, 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 it's not an insurance policy against that. It's part of the fabric of the music, but it could function in that way that it could work in a different church because every time a bell pitch is important in the ensemble, they find it by listening. And it has appeared before in a really isolated way so that people, people can hear it. Uh, a, a second option is uh, I would encourage them to commission a new piece if they wanted it <laughs> at the church. And then the third option is that I had taken recordings of the gestures, the bell triggers. Uh -huh. So then we would have a sound system in the, in the church because in, the, in that church, uh, the bells are rung from the ground floor, but obviously they're up in the belfry, but it was the summer festival. So all the windows and all the doors to the church were open. So the bell sound came in through from outside and back in. It was a very beautiful ethereal sort of cloud of sound. So I believe it would be possible to emulate that with the recordings and with the very carefully done surround sound, like a nono sort of solution, you know, uh, to have a, have a um, uh, what's the word? Um, you know, where you have a surround sound sort of sort of solution. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you would be open for a transcription, more or less. Oh yeah, I would. would be, uh, yeah, I would yeah, be open. Mainly, the church where I got married has a, a ring of six in G, mm. and so does one in Pimlico in London. So it'd be very interesting to take this piece on a tour. I should get some funding. <laughs> take this yes, piece yes. on a tour. Yeah, great. It would be a great project. It Absolutely. would actually. Yeah, right. I'm a huge right. fan of bells as well, of yeah. metal sounds. Yeah, yeah, that that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. One more if question, I can, somebody. Uh, well, yes, yes. If I can add one thing, uh, yes. yeah, because you know, with, with composing for uh, carillons or for bears, uh, that's a very big problem because there is there isn't any standard for tuning uh, them. So every church, every bell tower is different, and tunings are different. So uh, you always need to have that in mind uh, when you are composing a certain piece. Yes, in yeah, indeed. It's a bit like with gamelan, you know, yeah. like reason to yeah. tune, you know, yeah. it's a thing that exists. Yeah, yeah. I, I will just say something about um, Matt's uh, wrote, wrote something in chat. He said, "Will you commit to a piece in a different tuning rather than microtonal inflections?" And uh, yeah, I, definitely. Uh, I have done a little bit of that, uh, where I try to do it the other way around, where um, the 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 scudatura. Um, had no equally tempered elements at all, and then the what created the the, the harmonic rubbing, the the, the harmonic friction, uh, were equally tempered pitches that infiltrated from from nowhere. So I tried to do it the other way around, um, and yeah. So there was a scudatura that was set up a little bit like we saw yesterday in oh I'm no good with it in the presentation uh, about viola and scales. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, it's something like that, where the, the infiltrating pitches are equally tempered 12 video rather than the other way around. Yeah, yeah, I, I have, and I would like to do that again, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think we will stop and discuss further on. Yes. That's an, an interruption afterwards. But now it's a turn to Nicola. Thank Bissac. you very much. Thank Congratulations. You very much. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to Nicola Visadi, who is already waiting. And he'll speak about introduction to fractal music. And, and he will present the analysis of Sutra for Cario Piano, Fokker Organ, and Electric Guitar. Well, uh, Nicola, are you on the. Hi. Hi, you, Hi. Hear, you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, okay. but I don't see you. Or... Okay, yeah, I, I hear, I hear you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Here. Well, uh, I'll introduce a person 
and and you have written Nicola uh, my musical as a Nicola's musical research is focused on microtonal music firstly addressed to western instruments but now also towards new instrument created for microtonal music and towards eastern instruments this is also by Nicola grows a lot of collaborations with performers of non western instruments regarding western instruments properly modified and his important musical collaboration with the cellist Nicola de Letay on the view to have and play a special arpeggione. Uh, Nicola collaborates with Turkish guitarist Tolga Hancholu. We will meet him in one hour on our meeting. And from 20, uh, 2017, you collaborate too with a Mexican percussionist, Ivan uh, Chipakli, whom we had heard yesterday evening, in a presentation from Ivan Hernandez. And this is one of the few we would play the microtonal marimba, a quarter tone marimba has been presented yesterday. Nicola composed several works for the instruments for this instrument, the quarter-tone marimba, it was performed in Mexico, in Salzburg, Lisbon, and Zagreb, and commissioned by the commissioned by the Mexican Culture Ministry. Nicola had also two commissions for the Fokker organ in Amsterdam, and at the Mozarteum in Salzburg, uh, he gave a short dissertation in the years 20, 2015 and 17 on microtonal music. As regards, he writes uh, non to non-Western performers, particular that decided Alice and Jin, playing a guzeng, Siddhart, the teacher of Kodat and Rotterdam, playing the sita, uh, Ling Ling Yu, the pipa, and Paul Grant, santur and tabla. In this case, uh, Nicole tries to reinterpret both the theory and the way of playing the music of non-European cultures. On the contrary, Nicola treats Western instruments in a manner and the forms which partly recall those outside of Europe. And that's very interesting and I'm keen to look forward to your presentation, Nicola. Uh, one question before, uh, is your name Nicola Vizali? Uh, like the it's my artistic name. Ah, that's your artistic it's name. I understand. It's a yes. French pronunciation. Uh, my name uh -huh. is Nicola Vizal. Uh, that, that's when, a, when I had, I no, I, uh -huh. I, it's, uh, it's funny, but uh, I didn't choose this artistic name. Uh -huh. In Ukraine, where firstly I had a lot of uh, concerts, no, of my uh -huh. music. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. All the artistic directors all, all called me Nicola Bizarre uh, mm -hmm. Nic because uh, the Russian people <laughs> for uh, them was Nicola difficult. <laughs> so uh, I realized that maybe it's a good no, mm -hmm. for uh, artistic name. No? So but that, I must be, become acquainted with Vizali for, for me. Uh, the French. <laughs> the French. Yes, the French. French. Nicolas yes. Vizali. Mm -hmm. French. That's, that's French. But uh, uh, no, the Italian name. Yes, uh, I'm Italian. Italian, I'm Italian, Italian of course. Vizali. <laughs> <laughs> but now, from now on, Vizali. Okay? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay. Nicolas, Thank you. Turn. Thank you very much, Augustine and Johannes, for having me. Now I try to share the screen. Scream, 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 scream. Okay. Let's see if, let's see if. Okay. So uh, I will talk about uh, fractal music. At first, what is fractal? It is uh, a mathematical concept. In general, a fractal object is an object that if we zoom several times, we zoom in several times, maybe also endless, endless times, referring to mathematical fractal, 
we see nearly the same object, maybe with more details. We have in nature, for example, a lot of uh, fractal objects. I want to show you two of these. Maybe you see, this is one. Let's see. I don't know if you see, you don't see. Why you don't see? Let's try. I don't know why. I can't agree. Okay, it's this is you see this? This is a bigger this I guess the first level. If we zoom and we see this, it's the same of this object. This is a factor. Okay. So I thought, is it possible to think about the fractal music? I realized that uh, microtonality can, uh, with microtonality, we can um, obtain this uh, fractal sound object. Because you know, with a microtonal, we can have a different uh, microtonal systems. No? We have our Western system, 12 uh, steps each octave. We have a shruti. 22. We have Ecmelic 66. We have uh, um, 31. We have uh, Carrillo 96. No? And each of these um, systems can be thought as uh, a fractal zooming level. I also in my mind, I tried to, to put some uh, basic uh, theory in the fractal music. Oh. A very, very basic, because in composition you have to go uh, to, 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 to compose, it's not only theory. For example, imagine this, these uh, melodic ideas in our Western no? uh, music system. And now let's, uh, uh, let's zoom in Carrillo, which has 96 steps in every octave, eight steps for every same tone. This can be the same, the same notes, can be a zooming factor, for example, no? But it's not the, 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 the bigger zoom, zoom factor. This is the big. Because those all C, G is the minimal, no? uh, the minimal, it's a one semitone in a Carrillo Pieno, in Carrillo system. So it's a, more of this I can't zoom. This is another intermediate zooming. So the more notes, the more steps, we have in a microtonal system, the more possibility of zooming possibilities we have, of course. And this also for uh, chords. This is uh, in our system. Uh, this is a, sorry, this is not uh, uh, A, but C also. This is the same in Carrillo. This is an idea of the, the, no? the, the, the great zoom we can do because uh, C sol is, no? And this is an intermediate zooming effect. So here we see zoom factors, as I told you. So I decided to write a piece. La Scala Ensemble, based in Amsterdam, sent me a commission. La Scala Ensemble is made up of uh, Witter, electric Witter, Fokker organ. You know, Fokker organ has the octave divided in the 31 steps and the Carrillo Pieno, 96. So I thought that it was you know, an occasion, a good occasion to, uh, to write the first 
is thinking of fractalic, no? fractalic idea. And let's see if we can listen. Please, uh, Agustin, tell me if you hear before. Not yet. Simone? Yes. You hear? Yes, yes it's gone. You hear? Yes. Yes, okay, okay. So now we will listen to this piece and at the same time, I will try to show the score. It's difficult, but the old score. And uh, okay. Uh, of course, I have recorded this piece using at the moment sound libraries because the piece is scheduled to be performed in December, no? uh, pandemia permitting. No? But uh, now, today, nowadays, uh, sound libraries are quite good. So also the overall uh, MP3 is, uh, is good. I think it's good. So let's uh, listen. Where is? Tac, 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 tac. OK. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the sound is very faint. Uh... It's really hard to hear. This is microphone sound. Please share the computer sound. Um, uh, Nicola? See, moment, moment, yes. Did you understand? Okay. Please, you don't uh, hear. Okay, stop, stop get sharing. Get screen. through the microphone. And then again, share screen. Allora, nuova condivisione, start. Sì, nuova condivisione, ci sono due quadratini piccoli. Film, film, sutra, score, ottimizza, condividi suono. Ah, share, sì, share sound. Sì, sì. Sarà meglio così, grazie. Ok, share sound, share sound. Ok, I try again, I try again. It's okay? It's better? It's better? No. Uh -huh. The same. You don't... Vediamo un po'. Suta con score. Foto. Bagna. Condividi. Let's see. Still the same. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's the same. Um, mi vuoi spedire questo file, Nicola? Un momento, un momento. I can. E tramite, tramite sempre using, uh, using Zoom. Uh, anche, anche qua sul chat me lo, me lo puoi. Sì, sì, sì ok, sì. vediamo, vediamo. Allora, il chat. Controlliamo. Chat. Allora. Chat, chat, eccolo qua. Where is the chat? Ok. Agustin, ok, file, 
file. Oppure se c'è su YouTube. Sì, ho, 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 link. ho trovato, ho trovato, sì, ho trovato quel file. Melik Sutra. Ok, hai sempre. I don't know if you said I said. Ok. Ho inviato. Ecco, se lo vedi, if you see it, you can... No, ancora non lo vedo. Ma ha inviato qua al, al chat? Sì, sì. Ok. Ok, ancora no. Lo vedi? Sta arrivando? No. You see? No, no. no. C'è un link su YouTube, maybe? Eh, aspetta, sì, vado su YouTube. Andiamo su YouTube. Andiamo su YouTube. Puoi mettere il link uh, su... Sì, sì, chat. adesso vado su YouTube e ti metto il link. Ah, ok, grazie. go on YouTube. Grazie, scusa. And put the link, no, no. Ok, strano, strange. Mm -hmm. Sì, sì. Allora. Ah, in here. Ho trovato. L'hai trovato? Su, ah, sì, trovato? Sì. sì, sì, quindi okay. condivido io. Ti va bene se okay. condivido io direttamente? Sì, 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 fai, fai. Ok. It's ok. Uh. Ok, I'm sorry about this small thing.
Nintendo su stop video. It's finished. So we can see some bars only to have an idea. So it's the first. Of course, I had to. I was influenced you know, by the instruments, by their techniques, uh, and so on and so forth. So, of course, uh, it's uh, different to write a piece for uh, electronic music or for one instrument or another instrument. So, of course, we have to consider uh, this. Let's see, for example, some, uh, some bars. No? So, this is the beginning. I, I start with a Carrillo piano. These are... Uh, no? The me, e, f, f, d, s, and so progression, ta, 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 ta. Of course, no, I have no, a progression because I'm exploring, no, in a microtone, I'm zooming, I, I'm in the bigger zoom, no? and, and then, and then the electric guitar repeats the same progression on the contrary and in a more precise, concise way. And then this, ta -da -da, ta -da -da, ta -da. of course, this mode is a typical of you know, electric guitar. So it's, it's a depend of, of instruments. No? This idea I de developed here, but in a more precise and a more microtonal uh, way. Matter, bar five, the three instruments, the same progression, but one semitone below is interpreted in the various levels of zooming typical of the three instruments. Here, they have been placed on different octaves. However, it would have been just as interesting to think of placing them on the same octave. So, guitar, so guitar, this is the three, Carrillo, Carrillo. So the one note, this one note is more, no detail. No, because you know, it is in its, in its uh, microtonal uh, components. No? And oh. of course, in the Excuse future. Me, Nicola, um, can see? you share your screen? I think you, you want us to see. Ah, yes, yes, but you don't yeah. see. You don't see. No, ah. because I was sharing mine, but I stopped. Ah, OK, yes. OK, okay. OK. Thank you. Now you see. Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, so I repeat, I repeat, because, okay. So, uh, let's see some, uh, some bars. No? Uh, this is the, the beginning, the beginning. Allora, uh, I begin with Carrillo. There is an E, F, F, D, S, G progression. These are the note. A progression, these are all microtonal, no? Ways to go from this to this. It's a, semitone, and also with electric guitar repeats the same progression on the contrary and in a more precise, concise way. Of course, the rhythmic style, the phrasing I use here is typical of a hard rock guitar, and this is. The same notes, but in Carrillo Pieno, I uh, introduce all the so small details. I introduce all its components you know, of this uh, semitone. Let's go. In uh, bar five, all the three instruments, the same progression, but the one semitone below, okay, is interpreted in the various levels of zooming typical of the three instruments. Here, they have been placed on different where it would have been just as interesting to think of placing them on the same octaves. So here the guitar, is the guitar, semitones, progression. Here, Carrillo Piena, here the semitones, and all these notes no, belong to one, one semitone. The same for Carrillo, uh, for uh, Fokker organ, it's the same. These bars, Carrillo Piano, ecco, it resumes in an intermediate zoom what was pre-proposed by the electronic guitar. Of course, we listen in a different way. The same. This is the same. I copied exactly you know, the notes, but of course, uh, it sounds uh, very different, more, more, no, more detailed. Uh, 
Note the range of a Carrillo piano. The intervention of a Lette Guita and the four Carrillo will be right in the range. Also, Carrillo piano. Allora, Carrillo piano, Fokker organ, here. Here, a Lette Guita. This was, uh, no, a Lette Guita and Carrillo piano after again. But of course, it will be how it will be uh, sounded. Not different, of course. More, more in, in a different level. In a different level. Let's go. Bar 26, bar 26. This, yes. Fokker organ and electric guitar. The electric guitar executes D, F, Sol sequence, a typical of electric guitar. And the Fokker organ performs a zooming starting from the lowest level until reaching these notes. The sequence remains the same, one, three, four steps. One, three, four steps, this, a little by little, it opens, it opens, you know, Fokker organ, and reaches this, D, F, and G. Okay? At you, here, in a different, in a different way. And here, bar 35, here a Carillo Piero. These chords insist in two semitones, in two semitones. In this sequence, I move within the sequence F, F, D, S, Sol, Fa, Fa, D, S, Sol. Each chord is a sound that can be traced back to the zones of at least two basic sounds, in fact. For example, the first and second chords move within the sound areas of F, and F dieses. It's difficult to understand, no? This uh, difference. Here, instead, Carrillo Pieno and Electric Guitar, the range is E, F, F, dies, and each instrument develops it according to its own characteristic. This guitar, this is Carrero Piano. Carrero Piano, more detailed, of course. This is the final. The three instruments perform the same drawing, the same now, with different zooming. Here starts this Carrero Piano. This is, this range is uh, two, three semitones, not much. This is uh, Fokker organ, one octave, and this is electric meter, two octaves, but it's the same uh, drawing, the same. So this is some ideas, the first ideas, no? because I think that uh, no? we can find the more and more inspirations no? in order to uh, obtain, to create uh, no? a fractal musical object. And uh, yes, it's the first. Now I'm writing another piece of only for Carrillo Piano, and it is more difficult because uh, uh, relying only on one instrument is, but I used Carrillo Piano because as I told you, no, the biggest is the range of sound, the better is because you have more possibilities. So it's uh, for me, it's okay. If you have any question, I hope that you also will like to challenge, you know, to write or to fact the music. Why not? You hear me? Yeah. You can. Yeah. Then uh, I can. Uh, Thank you very much. It was a, a very interesting to, a combination of such instruments like the Carrillo piano and the, and the organ of Hans Fokker. And I wondered how you managed to get them together to one system. And, and wonderful was uh, the electric guitar added to this. And, and 
the wind sink. But what I'm very interested now, uh, you mentioned uh, the using of instruments from Eastern music. And could you tell perhaps some words, it's not too long for not much time, about using the Eastern instruments and how you compose with them? Ah, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh -huh. uh, yes. We, we have plenty uh, of time for questions, eh? Uh -huh. uh, excuse me, we have plenty of time. Yes. Uh, we have 40 uh, 10 minutes. minutes huh? 12 uh -huh. minutes, plenty of time. Uh, uh, only some words to that, for it's, it's very interesting. You mentioned it in your presentation. Do you understand? Uh, yes, okay. Uh -huh. I, I will tell you something about uh, you know, the Eastern, uh, uh -huh. Eastern instruments, you know? Uh, I have some collaboration, as told you, with a Tipa player, with uh, uh, also Santur, uh, with also other Indian uh, instruments. Uh, Do you um, at, the, at the moment, uh, I'm using uh, but uh, as electronic instruments, because you know it's difficult uh, to find. Uh, uh, Easter performance which uh, uh, read the notes. So for the composer, the Western composer, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to write for an Indian, for example, performer, because it's mm -hmm. an improviser. Yeah. And uh, for him it's very difficult uh, mm -hmm. to, to, write, uh, to write our music. Uh, and to write how do you, mm -hmm. and how to write, you manage? Not to, write uh, to, to see, to see, to see, to watch the music and to execute a score because they improvise. So at the moment uh, I use, uh, I wrote some pieces for old, for example, but using electronic uh, instrument, electronic sounds. I'm thinking how the Eastern performer can uh, play my music but I have to rethink what is writing music. I can't write the score in details okay. mm -hmm. for them. I have only to write some indication, for example, yes. a raga, mm -hmm. some indication, because a raga, what is mm -hmm. a set of uh, uh, indication, no? of notes, of uh, uh, ways of playing, and uh, inside these rules, uh, the performer will play. Okay. Mm -hmm. I tried uh, an, an attempt for an Indian performer, and we had uh, we had a premiere in Milan in conservatory, but I am not satisfied because uh, I think that he improvises too much than I wrote. So I, I don't know if he really followed what I wrote. So I have to think. So at the moment, I use this sound, but uh, using electronic sound. So ah, I integrate uh -huh. yes. my music, my music with these, uh, these uh, sounds, of course, uh, taking into consideration the technical, the, the technical, uh -huh. Uh, possibilities uh, uh -huh. of my instrument. So uh -huh. I don't only use the sounds, for example, uh -huh. the sitar, uh -huh. for example, the sitar uh -huh. of the old, uh -huh. no? but also consider the technical uh -huh. possibilities. So what I write is, could be performed if uh -huh. the India performer could read the music. But yes. uh -huh. as I told you, it's very oh. difficult uh, to uh, find. But it's, it's because a, <laughs> it's, a kind, it's a kind of integration. That I think that's a yes, keyword. At the yeah. moment, uh -huh. but uh, I would like really, but it's difficult uh, uh -huh. to find because if they don't study also Western music, uh, for them is impossible. You know that uh -huh. in India they have also different names of the notes. You know? uh -huh. not of, uh, of course, C yeah. uh, is yes, different. Yes, uh -huh. uh, it's different. Even if the sounds mm -hmm. are the same. Mm -hmm. Nicola, I think there will be a question with the audience. And yeah, Matthew Salis was commenting something. Mm -hmm. Matthew Sally was commenting on the chat. Maybe he would like to say something. Okay, I see the chat. Mm -hmm. Chat. He plays sounding into some unusual sounds. 
Beh, il New Jersey Summit B uh, is a New Jersey Carrillo Pieno because uh, I use the normal piano, I detuned, uh, so it, uh, no, it looks not, uh, it sounds not like a normal uh, classical piano. No? It, it, it's true, the Carrillo Pieno sounds uh, different than uh, the yeah. other. Also, for the focal organ, I used a particular uh, steps, particular no, sounds, uh, which I had in my sound uh, library. And maybe the combination of these uh, microtonal sounds uh, and this uh, particular timbre no, sounds the overall composition uh, a little no, uh, uh, unusual. Also interesting, as you see, to mix uh, different styles. I, I tried, I don't know if I had succeeded no? to reproduce the hard rock guitar. Uh, Agustin is a, a guitarist, so mm -hmm. I don't know what he thinks. If uh, this guitar uh, really uh, sounds like uh, a hard rock guitar or not. You are a guitarist, yeah, I'm not yeah, a composer, yeah. so yeah, yeah. I tried. At the beginning, so yeah, tried. some of the, the elements reminded me of uh, rock guitar. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Okay, so it's another characteristic of my way of composing. No? I try to mix different techniques, techniques, executive techniques from different music, folk music, no? Eastern music. Also, also I try to, uh, to play our instruments like Cam. In my YouTube channel, I have a lot of uh, violin pieces no? inspired yeah, from know, Macam. Yeah. Macam not only the, the tuning, but the way of playing. Mm -hmm. Macam music is different from our music. The structure is different. So uh, I try also in my mm -hmm. composition to this mix you know, Western instruments uh, with uh, uh, Macam Eastern uh, way of playing, for example. Or in this case, uh, the microtonal music with uh, hard rock guitar, with a focal organ, which is another no? a different, uh, different world, musical world, and so on. So I try this, uh, this mixture. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, but actually, I, I heard already a few pieces of yours, and I heard some lectures of yours. I'd like to ask you, why is this uh, multiple, this combination of multiple very different instruments, what, what is really the general idea behind this? What is your general goal where you're trying to communicate with uh, the use of the combination uh, of instruments? Yes, yes. Your I say, musical language? Yes, yes I, I am interpreting my discovering the microtonal world like uh, in the ancient, in the Renaissance period, for example, no? Uh, Fresco Baldi or other composer no? uh, afforded uh, the playing on the organ. They were improvising, they were searching new possibilities. No? So it is uh, this that uh, inspires me. I am approaching microtonality, but at the same time, I want to experiment, to improvise, no? like in the ancient times, I think that it is a new. No? Is a new world, mm -hmm. and so I am in this phase. I, I'm I'm not discovered anything because uh, it is all work in progress, you know? and because of this, I try to mix all possible, all possibilities uh, to create something new. At the moment, uh, I have not reached my goal, of course, because it is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's so it's, yeah, it's more exploring, a continuous yes, exploring. exploration. Exploring, okay. exploring all okay. possible, all possible. Yes, because all I possible. never heard you talking about this uh, thing, actually, about this. Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm exploring. I'm in this phase, and it will last a lot of time, of course. Mm -hmm. no? yes. I have a question, uh, if I... Ah, Ivan. Yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, I didn't get, um, maybe I missed that, but uh, what is the principle um, about uh, filling the gaps between the, when you're zooming, um, uh, 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 zooming a musical figure, 
you're zooming out, then you have gaps between nodes. How do you fill these gaps? What is the principle that? It's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's the first composition, so I, I have not elaborated at the moment the system. And the first is not the last or the, the, the tense uh, composition. I'm trying to create this uh, no, zooming. I'm trying to zoom at the moment, uh, and uh, I listen, and uh, okay, maybe I will not uh, very satisfied about this composition in these terms. Uh, maybe I have not uh, reached my goal with this composition at the moment, uh, will be another composition. So it's, it's a, uh, now I'm trying, it's only, uh, an attempt to, to explore this new, new world. But I would like to reach this goal. So like uh, the, the image, I, I hope you had the possibility to, to see, no? to see this zooming and see the same, near the same thing, but with more uh, Yes, yes. Also, sorry. we have to, uh, to transpose in a musical uh, context, uh, Considering that the music is, uh, develops in times also, and that images, uh, objects, uh, maybe not, maybe not. So it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. What uh, I, I wrote about uh, the first uh, theoretical ideas, really, uh, they are the first, very the First, so I don't know what will happen. It's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. Maybe you are you are right, but uh, I'm trying. I listen. I listen now. I'm write another composition, and I will see. Then I will write another composition, and uh, I will see. So, okay. so we will see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, any more yeah. questions in the group? Maybe a very last question. We uh, we just approach three o'clock in Austria. Yes. Hi, Nicola. Hi. Hi. Ah. Congratulations for your work. Uh, I think it's very interesting uh, to combine three system, microtonal systems. Um, why do you decide uh, to have they work? Your work. Excuse me. You, you can understand me. Yes, I, I hear you. So repeat, please. <laughs> Why did I choose this uh, ensemble? What's your question? Please repeat uh, the question. Uh, why did you decide to combine three, three systems, microtonal? And because these are the instruments. I had these instruments. I received the commission from a trio La Scala, and this trio is made up of electric guitar, Fokker organ, and Carrillo piano. And so doing, I thought that it could be perfect ensemble for the first piece using this idea of fractal music, because I, I have three zoom factors. No? I have electric guitar, our system, 12, 12 steps. I have a Fokker organ, 31 steps, so one zoom. And I have Carrillo Pieno, 96 steps, maximum zoom possible at the moment. So it was a challenge for me. No? So I, I, I began, I start composing and only composing. You, uh, you try to solve the problem. You try to really, you know, uh, Traduce um, ideas in uh, something concrete. So you have to write it have to, and to listen. And to listen. So that's the, the reason. That's the reason. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking of creating a guitar, a Carrillo guitar, electric guitar. So I will send some email to Augustine in <laughs> private. Uh, it can be also interesting to use this. No? But also, you understand, if I change my instrument, uh, the composition will be completely different yes. because uh, the technique uh, is different. So what I can write for Carrillo Piano, so the way 
I can obtain so-called fractalic music using Carrillo Piano will be different from using, for example, this new Carrillo guitar or another, or your, for example, vibraphone or your uh, xylophone or your marimba, or using your marimba, microtonal marimba, will yeah. be different music. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, Nicola, we have to, I mean, if you want to stay in the break, uh, continue uh, discussing anything, you're very welcome to do it. Um, we will have to go to the break. Unfortunately, we are three minutes uh, over the time and we will continue in 27 minutes. Thank you very okay, much, thank you. Uh, Nicola. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Th